The Detroit Zoo is an entertaining and educational public facility located at the approximate population center of the metropolitan Detroit area. The zoo plays host to over three million visitors each and every year. One of the major exhibits is the Birdhouse, the oldest building in the park, completed the same year that the zoo opened to the public. It houses only a small portion of the bird collection, with many other forms in the outdoor exhibits. The birds on exhibit in this building, such as are basically tropical perching birds. A visit to the building is an exposure to the full spectrum of bird life. Not just the sight of many multicolored birds, but the raucous, unforgettable sound of them as well. This is a female cock of the rock, with the more brightly colored male now in the center of the screen. There are many color variations in the species, and this is the apricot cock of the rock. Most of the cages have a variety of birds contained within them, representing the more colorful and active species. Some of them are readily recognizable to most of us. Some of them are not. And this bird is widely known, particularly by wily coyotes and fans of animated cartoons. It's the Roadrunner. He derives his name from the habit of dashing down roadsides, catching insects and other small animals frightened into movement by the passing cars located adjacent to the birdhouse is the penguinarium. The penguinarium too is quite correctly a birdhouse for it houses within it a collection of highly specialized birds, the penguins. The exhibit is a sophisticated one with the quality of the air controlled and of course the temperature and flow of the water also regulated. As a result of these carefully monitored living conditions, the penguin troop has demonstrated its happiness and good adjustment to the captive life by breeding quite successfully. These are birds that do not fly. However, they do swim and swim very well indeed. There generally is seven to 10 species of penguins on exhibit in the building, numbering approximately 50 specimens. They are basically a social bird. They congregate in large flocks and seem to generally enjoy each other's company. Some are snobs and associate only with their own species, while others are gregarious mixers, easily moving from group to group. Many people are curious as to how the birds spend their time. What do they do in the exhibit? Well, they walk, and they waddle, and they strut, and then they walk some more stretch their wings and they, of course, preen their feathers. They wiggle their tail vigorously. And they scratch. But their principal activity is a companionable stroll around the exhibit in company with their friends and an invigorating swim in the cool, cool, clear, clear water. The principal aim of the exhibit is to display the birds, but there are educational aspects also. For example, one of the several large murals depicts with some artistic license the various species of penguins found throughout the world and indicates those that are currently on exhibit within the building. Most people are totally unaware of the rich variety that exists in this group of birds. Many think there is only one penguin rather than realizing that there are at least 17 distinct varieties. Specialized care is given them, not only in the mechanical maintenance of the exhibit environment, but also in the food preparation. Each and every bird is fed individually. The first fish given to them is packed with vitamins. Each bird has a code number that identifies them. A detailed record is kept of the amount that each bird eats daily, as well as his general feeding habits. Behind the scenes in the building is a sophisticated control system. A tally board records all mechanical activity going on within the structure. All air flows, water flows, temperatures, filtration, and other mechanical elements of the building are regulated and controlled here. While both the birds and the public are unaware of this activity, it results in enjoyment of the exhibit by the public 
and of course the survival of the birds. Now adjacent to this sophisticated exhibit is a rural setting called the Woodland Stream, a most relaxing spot to stop and rest for a moment before visiting the Australian plains. Now, this is one of a series of geographical exhibits in the park that stress the variety of animals that may live in one area. And this is an emu, one of the large ground birds of Australia, distantly related to other similar flightless birds such as the African ostrich or the South American rhea. Also in the exhibit is a black swan, a relatively little known denizen of Australia. Many people are surprised to see the camel sharing the exhibit, not realizing while the camel is not a truly native animal to Australia, he is an introduced species brought in as a beast of burden that has taken firm hold. And the sight of these ludicrous lumbering animals is very much a part of the Australian landscape. Also included in the exhibit are the more traditionally thought of Australian marsupials, the kangaroos and wallabies, the leaping, bounding, pouched animals familiar to most of us. Now, what do kangaroos do in a zoo? They lie in the sun, they daydream, and they scratch. Nearby, hyenas nervously pace their exhibits, periodically stopping for a break. The Formosan, or Sika deer, are more serene in their wooded exhibit. Now virtually extinct in the wild, they seem to sense they are protected here in this sanctuary. And another species saved from extinction by breeding herds in zoos is the wizent, the European buffalo. Once rare, zoo propagation programs have successfully saved the species from extinction. The neighbors to the wizent are a thriving group of waterfowl in a small green belt. And in a pool across the way, a beaver swiftly submerges. The giraffe is the tallest animal in the world, sometimes exceeding 19 feet in height. This is the East African reticulated giraffe, identifiable by its well-defined network of narrow white lines. The giraffe is also one of the largest mammals, with bulls sometimes weighing as much as two tons. Its long neck makes feeding on the ground difficult, and they prefer to graze from trees or the highly placed feed containers in the quarters at the zoo. Giraffes have lived as long as 28 years as captives. While the Detroit Zoo has been fortunate in producing many young from their herd, the youngster is a somewhat ungainly creature, seemingly all neck and leg. The largest land animals on Earth are the elephants. Indian elephants, like these four formidable females, sometimes reach weights approaching six tons. Even the eyelashes are gigantic, over five inches long. The elephant is a vegetarian and must eat an enormous quantity of food to keep its huge bulk nourished. It will eat as much as 150 pounds of hay a day and wash it down with 50 gallons of water. Even as adults, Elephants seem to maintain a rather childlike joy of life and love to play with toys, although an elephant toy must be rather durable and not easily breakable. This truck tire is a great favorite. The elephant's neighbor in the pachyderm house is the rhino, a great lumbering beast with a surly and unreliable outlook on life. Its massive head is adorned by one or two horns that are not really horns at all, but instead growths of tightly compacted hair. Standing five feet at the shoulder and weighing as much as 3,000 pounds, the rhino is a lovable fellow only to another rhino. At a weight sometimes reaching four tons, the hippo is no little guy even compared with the rhino. His name means river horse, and while he is no horse, he loves the water and needs its assistance in supporting the ungainly bulk of his body. They are very protective of their young that weigh 100 pounds at birth, and the babies can swim before they can walk and usually nurse in the water. The lesser known pygmy hippo weighing a mere 400 pounds is less sociable than the common hippo, perhaps because of the greater hippo's prodigious smile. The hippo's mouth is second in size only to some whales, and when he grins at you, it's a hippo Grand Canyon from ear to ear. Several miles from the main zoo grounds in Royal Oak, the Detroit Zoo operates two exhibits on the island park, Belle Isle. 
One of them is the Belle Isle Aquarium, the oldest continuously operating freshwater aquarium in the United States. Here, a variety of aquatic forms, including both freshwater and marine water fish, invertebrates, reptiles, and amphibians are on display. The much fabled and dreaded piranha is shown in two different species. Their natural pugnacity necessitates a glass barrier between them, all but invisible in the water. The marine fish frequently are small fish compensating with splendid coloration for their diminutive size. Darting little jewels, many like this blue demoiselle are fierce little fighters. The brilliant coloration of this striped reef fish make him obvious in an aquarium, but camouflages him well in his natural surroundings. And nearly disappearing when facing you, this wafer-thin fish is a trigger fish. Despite his snake-like appearance, this is not a true eel, but the rare and unusual Australian lungfish. His tank mate is the South American Ticunare. This bizarre and glum appearing gentleman belongs to an extremely ancient group of fishes and is truly a zoological relic of a bygone age. His name, Osteoglossum, translates as bony tongue and he has a huge trapdoor of a mouth to consume his natural prey, other fish. The freshwater skate, or ray, possesses a poisonous barb in his tail that is very dangerous to the unwary human who might carelessly step on it. His unique mouth assists him in feeding from the bottom of slow-moving streams. The aquarium is not just a fish house. It exhibits many forms of aquatic life. This alligator snapping turtle is very much at home here. The lionfish, also called a zebrafish or scorpionfish, is another denizen of the tropic waters, capable of punishing an aggressor with venom, this time from barbs in the fins. It is a much feared fish in the area it originates in and is treated with respect by the aquarist who maintains it as a captive. The seahorse is recognized by most people, but few realize it is a highly specialized fish. And this scrambling fellow is a living fossil existing virtually unchanged for millions of years, the horseshoe crab. The starfish is instantly recognizable also. To the millions of visitors who have looked at the fishes in the aquarium, how many of you have considered how you might look to the fish? Also on the island park near the aquarium is a uniquely specialized group of exhibits managed by the Detroit Zoo, the Children's Zoo. Highly stylized, the miniature park is a youngster's fairyland brought to life. A treasure island exhibit displays the colorful macaw in an exotic setting of treasure chest and wrecked pirate ships. Other fairy tale designed exhibits include the mouse house. Mary had a little lamb. Heidi. The Miller's Pond. And of course the three little pigs who after a summer's feeding by eager visitors are not so little. The ability to get close to the animals is the fundamental purpose of the zoo. Here the child not only sees the young fawn, he is also able to pet him and feed him. And souvenirs are for sale at the facility. And even the waste containers are styled especially for the young visitor, encouraging them to keep their zoo neat and clean. The zoo is designed to appeal not only to all children, but the child in all of us and visitors of every age are enchanted by the cavorting animals. In a special corner of the zoo, space is set aside to let the human visitor actually enter the animal's home. Inside the nursery, special foods are available that the youngster may feed the animals who wait rather patiently for the lunch. For many city children, this is their first intimate contact with animals they had only seen pictures of before. Of course, not all animals may be petted. The regal cheetah watches the activity from a dignified distance, seemingly not as interested in the children as they are in her. Perhaps the most thrilling experience for the young zoo visitor is the pet ring, where the youngster hears a short lecture about a given animal and then is permitted to handle it under the supervision of one of the well-trained children's zoo keeperettes. For many children, this is their first opportunity to actually touch and hold an animal and have their questions answered simply and accurately. 
At first, many are rather dubious as to the value of the experience, but they soon join in the fun, even with creatures normally thought of as quite fearsome. Back at the main zoo in Royal Oak, the fall season is beginning. This time of year, the Dahlia Gardens in particular attract many people, and it's a favorite spot for the young visitor who focuses her appreciation very directly. The early fall weather suits the moose well, as he seems to prefer the cooler temperatures and the hint of winter in the breeze, probably reminding him of his natural northern haunts. This time of year, he grazes heavily, preparing for winter sparse foliage. To the prairie dogs, the changing temperatures trigger preparations for the coming season. To this little prairie rodent, it means storing food in body fat, and their heavy eating results in a noticeable plumping of their ordinarily rather sleek physique. The reindeer also note the changing season. They seem to know their time of year is on the way. The flamingos rather nervously flap their wings and move about awaiting the keepers who will transfer them to indoor heated winter quarters. The most conspicuous harbinger of the seasonal transition, however, is the changing colors of the leaves. Gone are the many variations of green replaced with a dazzling assembly of reds, yellows, and browns, and the park vistas take on a new perspective. The tiny Dorcas gazelle, even though it is a native of the Sahara Desert, seems quite unworried with the declining temperatures, and the fawn and mother exhibit no great concern. Like most tropical species, the Dorcas can adjust quite well to the northern winters if permitted to do so gradually. The cranes in this exhibit, the African swamp, are removed to winter quarters to await spring's warming trend and to care for their delicate babies. The crane family, including the African crown crane, belongs to an ancient group of birds that man frequently makes pets of, if not truly domesticating. The peacock is almost a trademark of the Detroit Zoo. This Asiatic handsome relative of the more mundane chicken and the colorful pheasant has been domesticated for hundreds of years. Few visitors are sharp-eyed enough to spot the well-camouflaged pea chick as he scampers through the grass. The bear dens are among the oldest featured exhibits in the park and have been visitors' favorites since opening day. In this mixed bear exhibit, five different species coexist harmoniously, more as a result of having been reared together than any natural camaraderie. This brown bear sits quite comfortably in his pool that's beginning to form skim ice on the surface. Many of the bear forms live in the colder regions, either the northern climes or in more or less mountainous areas. They greet the first signs of snow with activities looking to us almost like childlike gaiety. Some bat at the first snowflakes as they fall as if trying to gather bare snowballs. Some individuals, however, seem less enthusiastic about the dropping temperatures and look forward to the winter rather grumpily. While his companions play with the snow, this young bear searches for a warm place to sit. As the snow accumulates, the huge Kodiak comes out to inspect and taste it, showing off his new thick winter coat that protects him from even the cruelest wind. No animal enjoys the winter more, however, than the Detroit Zoo's internationally renowned polar bear herd. These white giants normally dwell in the frigid, storm-wrapped regions of the far north, and Michigan winters are like a trip to the old homestead for them. The polar is a massive, powerful bear whose weight sometimes exceeds 1,600 pounds and can stand up to a height of over nine feet. These regal creatures are the undisputed kings of the Arctic. Their name means sea bear, and they enjoy swimming and lying by the poolside all year long, protected from the cold by a heavy coat of fur and a thick layer of body fat. They are great favorites of visiting photographers, amateur and professional. Visitors to the park in the winter find the public walkways are quickly cleared of snow and parking or walking through the park presents no particular problem.
In addition to thousands of human visitors, the zoo plays host to an estimated 8,000 feathered freeloaders also. Principally, mallard ducks and Canada geese that winter over here instead of farther south. In order that their birds get an adequate diet, the zoo staff must provide a full larder for these transient bums of birdland. The streamlined little otters, nature's expert fisherman, is one of the few animals that seems to enjoy play activities even as an adult. In the wild and as captives, they build slick snow slides for the pure enjoyment of slithering down them, afterwards approaching the visitor as if inviting him to join him in his winter sport. The tiger is generally thought of as a tropical animal, probably because of countless Hollywood films showing him slinking down jungle paths. In reality, he ranges from the Arctic to the tropics, and this variety, the largest of all the cats, the Siberian tiger, is quite accustomed to temperatures of as little as 70 degrees below zero. This cat, like many animals in the zoo, is an endangered species, threatened with extinction in the wild. Quite fastidious, notice how she delicately shakes the snow off her paws before lying down. The winter does decrease the number of outdoor picnickers, but to compensate, open all year refreshment stands offer a warm, satisfying snack and a comfortable enclosure to enjoy it in. Not all of the exhibits change with the changing seasons, no matter how deep the snow outside or how differently the visitor travels through the zoo. The great ape exhibit remains temperature controlled and its inhabitants enjoy year-round comfort. The white-handed gibbons continue to swing on their modernistic exercise bars, stopping occasionally for a short rest. An impolite yawn displays surprisingly large canine fangs. Next door, the two young orangutans spend their day in a very placid, methodical sort of manner. Somehow, they create an image of great age and dignity despite their youth. Unlike their more vivacious monkey relatives, orangs seem to deeply contemplate even the simplest act before performing it. The brash, uncouth inhabitant of the ape house is the famous Joe Mendy II, fabled star of the animal show for years and now over 30 years old in retirement. Max, the biggest gorilla, weighs close to 600 pounds. He's really a rather reserved and mild-mannered gentleman who takes his daily vitamins quite docilely. Even as the midwinter temperatures approach their bottom limit, the well-insulated seal remains comfortable, no matter how cold his pool may look to our eyes. The young visitors receive their first lessons in animal adaptations as they compare their heavy winter coats to the Himalayan tar's thick winter fur. Inside their winter housing, the zoo's baboon troop ignores the crisp outside air in well-heated and expansive quarters. Mothers spend their time gossiping with each other and tending to the youngsters of varying ages. Here they lounge during the cold in a baboon vacation land, dining on fresh fruits, vegetables, and cereal, plus grain products. In the Holden Museum of Living Reptiles, it is perpetual summer, for the low temperatures are lethal to these cold-blooded creatures. In this complex exhibit, over 500 reptiles and amphibians are on display. Here, the eastern diamondback, the largest of the rattlesnakes, rattles menacingly at the visitor, while a calmer cage mate crawls up the glass, displaying the vividly marked belly. The sidewinder demonstrates his unique method of crawling that has given him his name. A golden cobra rears his head, more curious than angry, more cautious than aggressive. The 
24-foot-long reticulated python considers an early morning dip in his heated pool, while two deadly African gaboon vipers quietly watch the flow of visitors. The green mamba poses prettily, ominous even when still. And the milky cast of the blue racer's eyes indicate he is preparing to shed his old skin. The coral snake demonstrates his ability to crawl in two different directions simultaneously. The huge sea turtle interrupts his lazy cruise around his tank for a midday snack. The exhibit is not a snake house, but a well-rounded collection of the various reptiles and amphibians. The rhino iguana eyes his relative, the green iguana, somewhat suspiciously, and then nods in guarded greeting. A blue-tongued skink from Australia lazily licks his lips, while the fat-tailed gecko waddles over his grassy plot, the large ear openings at the rear of the head making him aware of even the slightest sound. Other lizards sit for their portrait, displaying the incredible variety of form and texture in these animals, ranging from the spiky scales of the horned lizard to the beaded scalation of the Gila, one of only two poisonous lizards in the world. Viewing conditions permit the visitor to observe closely animals normally seen only briefly and at a distance. Here, the real beauty of the animal emerges, and the common bullfrog becomes a wondrous thing. Even his delicate front foot is a fascinating thing to the interested visitor, and the frog, secure in his cage, poses quietly for a portrait. Brightly colored little salamanders gracefully swim in their tanks. A tiny amphibian, no larger than your finger, moves ponderously into his pool, his movements reminiscent of his ancient antecedents. This group, the amphibians, reached their supremacy well before their latter relatives, the dinosaurs, appeared. And much in their appearance speaks of this ancient lineage. Midway between the fish and the reptile, some retaining even fish-like gills all the way into adulthood. The zoo at night is yet a third world, known only to the animals and the nighttime security force. The watchmen observe the animals from a perspective unknown to most of us, here in the reptile house, not everyone appreciates being awakened by a midnight bed check. He accrues knowledge directly that most of us only read about, that lions frequently do sleep on their back, for example. And he usually is the first to know of new arrivals. These tiny lion cubs are accustomed to his nightly visits and greet him as an old friend of the family. The arrival of young is frequently the first sign that the long winter is over and soon the snow and ice will disappear to be replaced by the spring sunlight, gentle breezes and a new season of visitors. Most zoo visitors and animals alike enjoy the return to warmth and sunshine, but none more than the little bear that looked so forlorn at winter's first snow. He now sprawls luxuriously in the warmth, enjoying a fish dinner and looking forward to the summer season. Executive producer, Dr. Robert Wilson. Original score by Penn Dragons.